lately. In fact, he's the one I'm going to talk about at camp meetings, so get braced to hear about Paul. That's not a part of what I'm saying today, but it is on my mind. The Apostle Paul was given to one great theme in his life, and that was our union with Christ. Our union with Christ. This was such an overwhelming, all-consuming, saturating truth with the Apostle Paul that he literally ignored for religionists their major themes. Think about it now. Why is it that the Apostle Paul would never give us teaching on faith? He talked about faith some, but no teaching on getting faith. Why is it he would not talk to us about being sanctified or holy? He believed in it, but he never taught on it. Why is it he did not teach us on divine healing? He believed in it, he practiced it, but he never taught on it. Why is it he didn't teach us on having miracles, getting miracles, signs, wonders, miracles? He believed in them and practiced it, but he never taught on it. Why was that? The answer is simple. He had one consuming, overwhelming theme that was God's last word to humanity. And that theme was when you come into union with Christ, all of these other things are swallowed up. They're swallowed up. Why? You have the healer in you. Why? The life you now live in the flesh, you live by the faith of the Son of God. You have the faithful one in you. Why? You have the miracle worker in you. So his whole teaching finally summarized to the theme of union. As we so often say, over 200 times New Testament says we're in Christ. But 146 of those times are used by the Apostle Paul where it translates one with Christ or union. So his major theme is still the same major theme that is number one in all the New Testament church era. That's the in Christ position. That's why the New Testament doesn't deal with these subjects so much. That's why so many preachers have to go back in the Old Testament and to the synoptic gospels to find any teaching that is in an outer form. What the Apostle Paul did was to bring man from the outer form of living to the inner. Most of religion today hasn't come to that. It's still specializing in the outer form. It's still Jesus of Nazareth. We'll do this. We'll do that. He'll come. He'll walk into your rooms where you're sick. He'll come to your bed. He'll do this. He'll do that. Paul had no such gospel for that. He said the certified gospel is the revelation of the Christ that is in you not the Christ that'll come to you, not the Christ that'll be where you're in need, but the one that is already in you. That was the radical change that was made at Pentecost. At Pentecost, God allowed this radical change to take place because there was no more Jesus of Nazareth. There was no more ministry that was given to us by Matthew, Mark, and Luke especially, not John so much, but the synoptic gospel because now we had moved into a whole new plan of God, which plan was instituted before the world was created. Ephesians 1 and 4, chosen in Christ, chosen to be in Christ before the world was created. Well, think about it for a moment. If you have Christ in you, then all of these outer things must be swallowed up by that if you know that. Well, every born-again Christian has Christ in them. There's not anybody that's ever believed on the Lord Jesus Christ that doesn't have Christ in them. Christ liveth in me. His Galatians 2.20, the theme of the scriptures, the theme of the apostle Paul, and the theme of every believer. We all know Christ is in every born-again believer, but the believer doesn't know it. So he's, he's nil and void. He's of no <coughs> consequence in the believer's life because we ignore the Christ that is in us and go about to get him to get faith, to be where they're jumping and hollering and shouting and singing and blessings and outer things because we have no concept of the Christ that is in us. 
Well, it is only by the Christ that is in you that brings you to the reality of New Testament scriptures. And in the epistles, which is the bulk of the New Testament scriptures, the Apostle Paul has made his theme union. At least 146 times he says that the believer is one with Christ. You're not going to be one. You are one. This is not something you're growing into. This is something you are. Why? It came not by your effort, not by your faith, not by your works. It came by the birthing. It came when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you were born again. You have Christ in you. So the issue of union is not something you brought about. It is something that the Father has done. Once you take hold of that, then you've got a whole new world and a whole new life. A lot of people don't want that. A lot of people don't want to move into that, and that's okay. That's their level of understanding in religion. But for those who want to move into what God has done sooner or later, you're going to have to come to see that there is no Christ outside of you. That's religion. The only Christ there is is the Christ that lives in you and in other believers because there is no other Christ outside of the believer. Why? The only Christ there is today is the one into whom we have been baptized, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. And once you see that, then your world changes, your life changes. So the coming to union knowledge, the coming to this understanding that Christ lives in me and on God's part it was an intention that we be one, not two. We're all struggling here. There's still two of us. We're still a cup and coffee. We haven't become a cup of coffee yet. We're still two things. But the purpose of Christianity is to bring us to that oneness where we can say with Galatians 2.20, I no longer exist in my former form, yet I exist, but in another form, the form of Christ. That's the way I exist. So I'm no longer a cup and coffee. I'm a cup of coffee. We're one. We've been unionized. We have been joined together. And of course, our best scripture for that is in 1 Corinthians 6 <coughs> and 17. A little verse that says, But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now you have to have some sort of understanding of what is involved in this scripture. We have a technical term that religion doesn't talk about very much. I can remember in my uh, days of teaching that uh, sometimes uh, I would veer off on this subject and hardly anybody knew what I was talking about. That is, I've taught in four different Bible colleges and in seminary, and, and I would veer off in the direction of a term that we call kenosis. Kenosis. This is a term that simply means self-emptying, self-limitation. You know what osmosis is. It's a continuation, a growth. Kenosis is the very opposite of that. It is a limiting. It is a self-denying <coughs> process. Well, the only way two can become one is for there to be this kenosis. There must be this self-denial, this self-limitation. Self-limiting must be on the part of those that do this. For instance, you know what union is. Uh, the best way to explain that is in the technical term of a union joint. A union joint. You've got a couple of pipes that you're wanting to put together, and you're able to do that Whenever you buy a union joint, it joins these two pipes together and makes them one. That's what Christianity was intended to be. God never intended that Christians become gods. He never intended that we become Christ. He intended to put Christ in us, but he intended by that that Christ would express himself as we were, which is what a Christian is. We call that talent. We call it a lot of different things that Christ comes out of me through my talent, but he comes out of you like you are. He comes out of all of us like we are. Sometimes it's not a very pretty sight, but that's the only way he can get out of us is, is the way we are. And so we seek or we work toward uh, <coughs> coming under subjection to him. 
Well, if you're going to join these two pipes together here, you've got to have a union joint. Well, our union is made up by Christ. Christ is our union joint. What he has done is to join the believer to the Father. That was God's ultimate intention, that these two be joined together. And when you have a proper union joint, then it is as if there is no discontinuation at any point of this life, <coughs> that you have indeed become one. That was God's intention. That's the most often stated truth in the New Testament. Now, I have a hard time with people on this because I've read a bunch of books just the last two weeks on the, on the subject of uh, Christ in us, that wherever I could find one. And the fact is, no writer sees that because he doesn't see how we became one with the Father. We become one with the Father because the Father has placed his seed in the believer so that the believer is what is the offspring of God or the production of God or as Paul said, the workmanship of God. Because this father has put his seed in this believer, then this believer starts out with the potential to be one with the Father because of Christ in him. Well, Christ has joined us to the Father. He has joined us to the Father so we can be one. Do you realize when you were saved, you became everything God intended his offspring to be? It's in the seed. It's in the nature. You became a partaker of God's nature. But your trouble is you don't know that. So instead of you becoming one with God, you kind of become a pipe down here that's seeking the Father. That's what religion has done to us. It has us in a disjointed relationship with God. I preached disjointed relationship much of my life. I said, if you don't come to church, you won't be blessed. If you don't give, you won't be blessed. If you don't win souls, you don't love God. If you don't read your Bible, you don't love the Word. So what I was doing was preaching a disjointed relationship with God. I didn't start with the fact that God had already put his nature in the believer and that the believer already was a seed from God, ready to bear his fruit, ready to bear his personality traits. I had denied people that first because they didn't know it, second, because when I found it out, it was a hard thing to preach. <coughs> I wasn't in a place that was open to it. That's why I'm meeting here in the Holiday Inn to find people who are open to what it is the Scriptures actually say. The Scriptures actually say that from the moment you were born again, you were one with the Father. But you have been denied that and been placed down here by religion in a disjointed position. Now that's what you that's what you face. A lady said to me that last week, said I was watching a preacher on television and said I went and turned my television set off mad. And I said, Well, you were in a disjointed position. Because that isn't what joins you to the Father. His doing, religion, would never join you and make you one with the Father. So we've all been through that. We have all are a part of that. And so what we're seeking then is something that will bring us in touch with the Father. So we have these momentary blessings where we really feel in, in line with the Father. We, we, we like a meeting where we're happy, where we're singing, where we're shouting, where we're seeing miracles, and we just feel real good. Well, that's kind of a... A plastic, you know, the, uh, us plumbers know about little plastic pipes now. If you don't have one pipe meeting the other, you can get one that's uh, sort of plastic that you can just bend around and, and make it fit. Well, that's what religion has become. It's become a make it fit type thing. But that's very temporary. That's not nearly as good. That's not nearly as good as forming this union joint that's permanent. So we come into union with Christ. Now, in order for that union to work, the believer must be willing to give up his nature for the seed. That's kenosis. But that's not all there is to kenosis. Kenosis is God giving up certain things to take you on. We call that grace. You think it's 
amazing how much you had to give up to become a Christian? Have you ever spent any time thinking what God had to give up to take you on? See, that's kenosis too. What he suffered the loss of, what he gave up. I was thinking about it on Good Friday, some of the things that the Father gave up, and I, I would have to think that the hardest moment from a human viewpoint purely, but the hardest moment my father has ever had in all of his history, worse than Adam denying his word and taking on the illicit knowledge, worse than Abraham taking on Hagar's seed, worse than David in adultery, worse than anything you can find in the scripture was that moment on the cross where Jesus looked up and said, Father, have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I'm sure that's the hardest moment our Father ever had to go through. See, some people don't believe God's real, but that's a real thing there because he suffered and hurt. I have feeling, I have empathy with that. He hurt and suffered so much, he cried out to God, my God, have you forsaken me too? My mother's gone off, my brothers have gone off, the disciples can't be found, a couple of them's denied me. Have you forsaken me too? My God, that was an awful moment. What did God have to give up at that moment? He had to give up ultimate sovereignty. He had to give up omniscience in behalf of his son. He had to give up every power that he had, which must have struggled within him to say, my son, I won't let this happen to you. But he gave it all up. That's kenosis. That's what works in order for union to take place, this kenosis. Well, you and I have always heard, if we want God to bless us, we need to kill self. You know what I think of that. You don't want to ever do that. Why? Because this believer here is a self that is joined to the Lord. Nothing wrong with yourself. You know that now, don't you? You've looked in the mirror and say, I'm a dirty, no count thing. You're wrong. There's nothing wrong with yourself. <coughs> Never has been anything wrong with yourself. There was never anything wrong with Adam's self. The thing wrong was who came in to operate that self. Satan was what was wrong, so we became children of Satan. And he was what was wrong. He operated in us and misused us and got our minds so mixed up that when we get born again and have Christ in us, we have a hard time accepting it because we got such messed up minds. But the father knew all about that, so he said, you're going to stay there with a messed up mind till the resurrection morning. And he said, in the meantime, don't feel bad if you groan and grunt and cry to get out of these bodies because you're going to finally see my trouble is my thinking. My trouble is in my head. My trouble is my very body. And I cry to get out of this body. Well, he said, don't feel bad about that. That's the way it's going to happen. But your hope is that on the resurrection morning, you're going to get a body to go with this new spirit you've got that's compatible with it. Now, you're going to go through this thing we call kenosis. The Apostle Paul went through a radical period of kenosis in Philippians 3. It, was, it is in Philippians 3 that he says that everything that has made me who I am as a self, my birthing, my parents, my background, my ethnicity, my education, my ministry, everything that's made me who I am, I suffer the loss of. Now, that's pretty good. You say, okay, I'll lay all that down to the Lord. But he went one step further, and maybe that's what's wrong with some of you that have a trouble with resurrecting yourself from the dead constantly. You believe in miracles. You're always resurrecting yourself rather than leaving yourself dead. What he did, he said, I not only suffer the loss of everything that makes me who I am, but I make it dung. I make it fertilizer. 
I put it around my little seed and makes it grow better. <laughs> Fertilizer. I did fertilizing this last week. Got a bunch of horses and I had to do something with their self. <laughs> <coughs> So I took it out and put it around my bushes, all around my property. Makes the seed grow, supposed to, hope it does. But you know what? That's what Paul did. He counted it but dung. Why? For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus his Lord. What was the knowledge? The knowledge was this union. That's what the knowledge is. Now that's the knowledge you're denied in religion. Religion says, hey, believer, go down here and get your blessing. Go down here and get your miracle. Come to church, teach a Sunday school class, and you'll go to our happy hunting ground. Keep on coming. Keep on doing. But in all of that, you're being denied this knowledge. Someone said to me not long ago, why is it that uh, people don't preach the Christ life? Because I hardly talk to a preacher ever says I don't believe part of it. The reason they don't preach it is because of this word. Now, they don't know that, but that's why they don't. It costs too much. It costs you your program in the church to preach Christ. I was talking to, uh, who was it? Uh, uh, Andy Hansen uh, yesterday morning over in Tulsa and we got on this subject and uh, the reason why people are not preaching Christ is because it cost them the program and I said well I could have programs I've got enough people we have about uh, 1500 people a month come into our meetings in, in groups like this and I said I could organize them put them all together and make them feel like that if they did something they'd be a whole lot better off and I could bring out all kinds of programs. But I said, most of our people have been delivered from programs. That's why they come to see Christ. They got tired of programs, whatever it was. And I said, it's hard to grow up in Christ and at the same time maintain the preacher's program. You know why? Because if I got a program sooner or later, that's all I'm going to preach to you. Oh, I'm going to use scripture. I'm going to tell you we got to build this orphanage. I built two orphanages in Mexico, so I know about it. I said, we're going to build this orphanage in Mexico. And before long, every message I preach would center around folks, if we really love the Lord, if we really pick up the cross, if we really love our word, we're going to get that thing built down in Mexico. What would I do? I would turn everything I was doing into the program. Well, what have I done by that? I have denied you the Christ that is in you who only and singularly wants you to be the Father's offspring and nothing else. That's all he wants is to make you one with the Father. Why? He didn't pray in the Lord's Prayer for anything else. You remember the Lord's Prayer, John 17? He said, I don't pray for the world. So right then he cut out all our programs. He said, I'm not praying for the world. I know they're lost. I know they're going to go to hell. I know they got problems. I know they're sick and they're hurt. But he said, I don't pray for the world. Why? Because that isn't what the father started out to get. He started out to get offsprings, children. And so he prayed that as I'm one with the father, you will be one with me. Isn't that simple? Now, the people that are one with the father carry the burden and the load as they can, as they feel led, they minister, they love, they give, but you don't organize them. I'm going to tell you something you can look out for. This is me now. Nothing of the Spirit. It's just me. <laughs> but you're going to find most religious programs do very little in solving the problem. Their main purpose is to keep believers nose to the grindstone. They do very little. Why? We're living in a world that has too many contrary situations in it. Everything just seems to be contrary. You see, I'm not uh, uh, preaching every time I get up against homosexuality and I don't believe in it. But the reason I don't 
spend a lot of time with it is it's contrary. It's contrary to life. Homosexuality is contrary to life. Don't care who you are. I'm not against the homosexual. It's just contrary to life. If it had its way, we wouldn't have any life. Abortion, I'm not out fighting abortion. Thank God for those that are. But abortion is contrary to life. It's a contrary, anything contrary to life is not going to continue. Sooner or later, it's going to pass. Good illustration, communism. We always knew that communism was contrary to life. It's contrary to the way people are put together. What happened to it? It ran its course. It can't continue. Everything in religion that is contrary to what God's purpose is is not going to continue. It won't continue. I've been in numbers of things that didn't continue because they were not ultimately what God wanted us to do. I've been a part of them, gave my life to them, but it wasn't what God was doing. What is he doing? He's getting children ready to come up to his house. He wants that to be seen. He doesn't want to just save sinners from hell. God so loved the world that whosoever believeth will not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, he didn't want them to perish. He did love them, but that wasn't his... His in intention, his intention was that they be his. And that's the gospel that's kind of gotten lost. So that's what we're all about. Nobody likes kenosis. They don't like this self-emptying thing. Now remember, nowhere does the scripture tell you to get rid of self. You need to change your language there. I come in contact with believers every once in a while and say, well, what we need to do is crucify self. No, you don't. You need to crucify what self does, but you don't need to crucify self because that's, what, that's the part of you God made that brings him glory. Well, when I was a preacher, I had everybody crucifying themselves because they didn't agree with me. It took me 20 years to figure out that God made everybody different from me, and I couldn't come along and stereotype them because my ministry was stereotyping. That's what all Baptists do. We make all Baptists alike. We don't say we're glad to be Christians. We say we're glad to be Baptist. We got stereotyped. That's what most religion does. You, go, you give up everything to be what all the rest of them are, but that's contrary to your creation because you were created by God to be different than anybody else God created. Christ fulfills who you are, but he doesn't change who you are by your creation. We don't want to give up self. Self, nothing wrong with yourself. So don't run around saying, I'm going to crucify self if it kills me, because it, it will if you try to do that. <laughs> <clears throat> what you want to do is to deal with self-righteousness, self under self. What you want to do is deal with yourself as the scriptures would have you. In fact, we all are misled in believing that we are an independent self. The reason we have a hard time becoming one with Christ is because it has gotten fixed in our mind that I'm an independent self. Now, you see, in, in one regard, you've never been an independent self. You've never been an independent self. You've either been motivated by Satan, had the sin nature in you, or you got the God nature in you by the birthing. You've never been an independent self. You think you were, and the reason you think you were is because at one time you had the liar in you. He was such a liar, he has so messed up your mind that to this day you're not clear. None of us really are. We're still fighting in our mind. That's why Paul comes along and says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, or but you have the mind of Christ, or be not taken up with the world, but be renewed in the spirit of your mind. His whole message came back to the mind because that's where the problem is. Problem isn't with us getting saved. Problem isn't with us getting forgiven of our sin or getting a miracle. The problem is we don't know about it. We don't understand it. And what you don't understand, you don't live. You don't live. Uh, the alcoholic doesn't know that once he's born again, he's a new creation. So what we do is begin to work, change his mind. Upgrade his thinking. See? And once your mind changes, and once you get yourself as a mind under control, then you can be who God made you to be. I want to turn you loose for you to be who God made you to be. I just want you here every third Sunday. I want you to be free to do as you please, but I'd like for you to bring an offering when you come. 
But you see, at some juncture, kenosis has to take hold where you make a commitment to something. You're not an independent self. You never have been. You have gone your selfish way because you've been lied to so much. The old nature that was in you, the old man, your old way of doing things lied to you so much that you're like the woman in Romans 7. At times when you get down and the CNS gang attacks you, you go back to an adulterous love affair with that old man, your old way of doing things. Well, I'm not going to stand here and tell you you won't be tempted to go back. I'm just going to tell you that you double your sin. You not only go back to doing what is wrong, but you go back to a love affair that doesn't fit you anymore. It's like a one-night stand. Gets you into more trouble than it does good because you're now carrying on an adulterous affair with an old man you're not married to anymore. You've never been an independent self. You've been lied to. Your mind's been messed up. There's never been anything wrong with yourself. God made that self in his likeness and image. And the world's been denied that message because they think religion is me becoming something that all the religionists are. And that's the last thing I want you to be is what I am. I want you to be who God created you to be. That's when union begins to take place because Christ joins this union to what? To what it is the Father has created, what he has birthed. Christ joins us to that. He is the, the, the source and the power that, that joins us to that. So kenosis is nothing but a form of submission. It's that submission we must come to in order for the Christ in us to be alive. Well, in order for this to happen, you're going to have to come to a place of submission. By getting yourself under control. I'd like to tell you that you can have a miracle of the mind. I don't talk about this enough. And I sensed it this week when I was thinking about these thoughts. I'd like to tell you you could have a miracle of your mind. I'd like to tell you that you could have a miracle called a revelation of Jesus Christ by an instantaneous work of God. When I first had a revelation of Christ, it was so great to me that I thought everybody can have this. And so at that time, I was in the healing ministry in a great way. And I thought, uh, what I'll do is start laying my hands on people to have a revelation of Christ. I was laying hands on them to be healed, laying hands on them to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So now that I'd had a revelation of Christ, I'd lay hands on them. I was in a meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, in the downtown auditorium. About 70 churches were supporting this meeting. And so I decided on this night I'd call everybody down that wanted a revelation of Jesus Christ and I'd lay my hands on them. And I started doing it and it it was dead to me. Everybody was jumping up and down, shouting because I was touching them, laying hands on them. But uh, there was something missing. And finally I said, oh God, what's wrong here? And the Holy Spirit said to me, you can't take that out of my hands. Quit trying. Well, <clears throat> I learned something then. Free grace is what we get by the finished work of Christ, like healing is, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're gifts. You can take those, but you can't take what God's put in your control. And he has put commitment and choice in your control, and you've got to do it to make it work. So from that time on, I never laid hands on anybody that wanted a revelation of Christ. And people have faulted me through the year. They said, if you'd just pray for us, we'd have an instant revelation of Christ. I said, I can't do it. I've got to leave that work to the Holy Spirit to lead you into the fullness of Christ, to bring you to full stature. There's no instant miracle because it's a miracle of the mind. It's a miracle of the renewal of the mind. And you don't get it just like this. You don't get it instantaneously. I've had people that's been in these, some of you know old Ernie, he'll be up at the, 
up at the old, he's a little older than I am, I can call him old. <clears throat> Ernie will be up at the camp meeting, and Ernie hasn't missed a meeting. He hadn't missed a meeting ever in Portland. For at least eight years, he never missed a meeting, but just this last year, he had a revelation of Jesus Christ. He all of a sudden saw and knew the difference between him knowing in his head and knowing in his spirit that he was one and joined with the Lord. I hope he talks about that. Because you see, I can't do that for you. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 1, when I wanted to know this Christ who was in us, I didn't go talk to the brethren at Jerusalem. Because he said, I sensed that those Peter, James, and John didn't know what it was I needed. So he said, instead I went into Arabia and Damascus, and I stayed there three years, and during that time, God revealed his son in me. Isn't that interesting? Well, once I got back to the scriptures, I could see how I had not tied the thing together properly, that it wasn't in me to do that for people. My mission was to preach the gospel. My mission was to lay out the truth. It was the Holy Spirit's mission to bring people to the revelation that they were one with Christ on his own. Well, through the years, I saw people get every kind of blessing in the world. They got healing, signs, wonders, miracles, baptism, gifts. They got every outer thing, and there's nothing wrong with them except they never come to the fullness of who they were. Who, who they were. Now, how do you come to that? You come to that by a self-control. Nobody can hunger after God but you. If the boy really loves the girl, she can trap him. She can cook pies for him. She can love him to death. But she can't make him love her till he makes up his mind. Is that all right? Why? Because that's the what he controls. He controls his mechanism of choice. So do you. What is choice? We've said it so many times before. That's the step that brings love. The right choice brings love. What makes a marriage work? It's when the old boy finally says, she's it. There is none other. I don't want another. I never want another. I know she's not perfect. I know she hits me once in a while. <clears throat> I know she spends my money, but she's it. I've made the choice. Now we're ready for love. I can see that happened to all of you. Somebody made their mind up about you. But that's what makes a marriage work. It isn't because they flow together. <laughs> it isn't because they think alike. Impossible. No two people ever think alike. It isn't because they blend like coffee. <laughs> it's because somebody in that union makes a decision and says this is it it's when he looks her in the eye and says girl you may kill me one day but I love you and I'll be there for it to happen <laughs> I mean that's where it's got to be they say, well that don't fit me there is no me well, that isn't the way I'm put together. There is no way you're put together. You got put together wrong by Satan. Your thinking is wrong. When you make a choice, that's what does it. Now, if you can't make that choice, don't mess around. Don't mess around with a mate, and don't mess around with the Lord until you make a choice. You know what's wrong with religion today? <clears throat> they got preachers right now being investigated by all these magazines. I don't know whether you buy any of these Christianity today or charisma, but they're all investigating preachers right and left. You know what's wrong with the public that supports these preachers? 
They've never made a choice for the Lord. I couldn't do it because I made a choice for the Lord. I couldn't return back to outer things. I've made a choice to it. All this baloney that I see going on in the religious world today, especially the charismatic, blows my mind. Somebody said to me this last week uh, up in uh, Boston, they said, how in the world can people follow a thing like that? I said, Christianity is such, such a low ebb right now in outer things. They have no inner consciousness of what a Christian is or how to live anymore. So they back anything that comes along, even when it's proven wrong. They caught, this, they caught a preacher uh, here the other day that was doing things wrong. And so the press asked him, why do you do those things? He said, I know it's wrong. I own up to it. I've done wrong. But he said, I bless more people doing wrong than anybody else in religion. Well, I almost wanted to agree with that statement. But the thought came to me, what has he done to Jesus Christ who lives in him? and who lives in all those misguided souls. What happens to Christ in them? Where is Jesus? Because you can fool the people with signs, wonders, and miracles, I know. I've been there. But you can't fool people who know Christ lives in them and who are fed by the Word to be who they are. Can't fool them. Control. That's what you have. You have the control as to your decisions. Now, if you make your mind up to follow Jesus as your life, as your God seed, as your nature, that's a decision you make. The seed's already in you. Christ is already in you. All you're doing is making your mind up to acquiesce to that, to live that to express that, to learn of him. That's your decision. That's what this believer must do. The believer must sooner or later make his mind up that if I am to be what the Father has created me to be, then I'm going to have to join with Christ. I make that decision. Not religion, not works, not law, but I join with Christ. I think the reason we don't want to make a decision for the Lord often is because of two of the key words that have to do with kenosis. They are the words identity and rights. You see, it's a little hard on us to follow Jesus closely as Jesus of Nazareth. Because what he did is suffer the loss of his identity. In fact, Jesus of Nazareth never really had an identity as Jesus of Nazareth. We've given him that. He never had that identity. What was his identity? It was the Father. I am the Father of one. I only do what I see my Father do. The works that I do are the works of my Father. The words that I speak are the words of him that has sent me. His identity constantly was the Father. Now you have that Christ in you. That's your life. And a wonderful thing happens every once in a while in our fellowship. I've seen it come up every two or three years, and that's this fatherhood business. We've got a strong manifestation of it right now by... Every two or three years, this seems to flourish and grow, and I'm glad for it. The Spirit does it. It's, it's right now. I wouldn't be surprised in this camp meeting we didn't have a lot of talk about fatherhood. But you see, the whole of God's plan is to bring the children back to the Father. So Jesus lost identity as himself. He lost identity as himself right off when he began his ministry. He suffered the loss of this identity, just like Paul did in, in Philippians 3. Jesus did, uh, Jesus did it in a, in a kind of a strange way. Uh, whenever uh, Cain of Galilee, which was the first miracle of Jesus, took place, uh, Jesus dealt with the identity problem right then because Mary came to him and said, uh, they've run out of wine at this party, and you really could help us get, us get us some wine. 
And you know what he did? He took his first step toward loss of identity. And he didn't say, Mama, I can't do this now. He said, Woman, did you catch that? Woman, what did he do? He put her in the same place as every other woman, no longer his mama, no identity. And from then on, he never recognized that identity. His mother, brothers, and sisters came to a meeting. They said, your mother, brothers, and sisters are out here. He said, I have no mother, brothers, and sisters except those who do the will of my father. Another loss of identity. And finally at the cross, he said, woman, behold your son. Right, you brought me into the world, but you're not mama. My identity belongs to my father. A little hard on us, isn't it? You have the control within you to handle that. Well, you're not going to do that unless you have some knowledge to go along with it. That's like telling you to operate a computer without any knowledge of it. But I'm telling you that's in the future for you. That's in your walk that soon you're going to be drawn back to the Father because the Son's going to put you there. The Son that is in you is going to put you back to that fatherhood relationship. Rights, that's what's separating all of us now is our rights. Rights. Religion has lots of rights, but they always end up wrong. Like two deacons in a church down in uh, Houston was counting the money on a Sunday morning, got mad at each other, and one of them said, I got rights, took out a gun, shot the other one. That's what you call rights. <clears throat> I used to preach at a church over in Arkansas, Pentecostal church, and that church, every year when it had its annual business meeting, had to bring the sheriff and two or three patrol cars in <laughs> to have their annual business meeting. They were notorious for knockdown and drag outs. That's right. I read everywhere I go about churches suing each other, deacons or people in the church suing the church because they said we put our money into this thing and now then it's going a different direction than we want it to go, so we're going to stand up for our rights. Well, what happened to Jesus and all that? What do you think he does? That's what kenosis is. Kenosis is us coming under the self-control to where we willingly suffer the loss of our rights. You know what I'd like for you? I'd like for you to grow up in Christ to such an extent that you would never be hurt over your religious rights. <coughs> that I would have never laid out any kind of a program whereby your rights were so important that you could be hurt or you could hurt somebody else. I've determined to do that because I've been through the hell of religion many years. And I'd like to see God's children come to a rest. If you don't like what I say, don't listen. If you don't like what I do, don't come here. It won't make me love you any less because I want you to come to know who you are in Christ and to grow up into that. And a lot of people can't do that. Andy said to me yesterday, he said, I've got some folks here in Tulsa that are not coming to meeting anymore. And he said, the Spirit told me that they're going to have to go wrong before they go right. I said, that's good. We teach that. See, people get a little bit of knowledge. They get a little bit of understanding and they decide on their own to do something. So they're going to go wrong before they finally make their mind up to go right. But the whole of it is, you have to make your mind up to do what is right. It's something you make your mind up for. You have that control. But let's say you don't make your mind up. You don't make your mind up for Christ to be your all and to join you to the Father and His plan. I'm going to prophesy a little bit. You're going to have a regular schedule from the CNS gang. <laughs> Why? 
the Father's not going to deal directly with you, but he's going to deal indirectly. Now, I know some disagree with me on that, but I've been in the Lord's work a long time, and they say, well, God let that thing happen, and I'm mad at God. I don't believe God ever deals directly with his children. You know what I think? He deals indirectly. Let me give you an illustration. We have the father in Luke 15 called the prodigal's father. If ever there was a father that loved his son and ever that a father had the power to help his son, it was this father. And I believe that father knew every step that son took downward away from him. But you know what? That father never raised a hand to help that son. Now Luke 15 has three parables in it. It has the parable of the woman sweeping the house until she finds the coin. And the next parable is the good shepherd that leaves the 90 and 9 and goes out and finds the one lost sheep. But the third parable is a strange thing about God. We have God looking for that which is lost. We have God the shepherd looking for the sheep that's lost. But we don't ever have God looking for a son that is lost. Why? He doesn't deal directly. He deals indirectly with that son. That's what's going on in some of your lives right now. God dealing with you indirectly. How did he do that? He let that boy take money that he couldn't use and didn't know how to use. He let that boy go into a far country. He let that boy join himself to a citizen of that far country. And he let that boy go into a hog pen. Why? So that the boy could come to himself. That's what the scripture says. And when he came to himself, Father, let that happen. Now, any point along the way, if that boy had, had any sense, he would have said, even when he first took the money and got out there and saw it dwindling away, he was wasting, he could have said, boy, I need some of the accountants back in my father's house. I'm going to waste this whole bundle of money. I need bookkeepers. I need somebody that's got some sense to help me. I'm going to get back to my father's house. He could have made that choice right off. He could have made the choice when he went into the far country and saw all those strangers there. Boy, I'm with a crowd I don't know anything about. Did you ever in your ride of sin end up with a crowd that you looked at and, and thought, my Lord, what am I doing here? You, you get into the crowd. He could have come to his senses then and gone back to his father saying, boy, I don't like all these strange people. I think folk feel that way when they come see us sometimes. <laughs> I don't like all these strange people. I'm going back to my father. He could have made the choice then when he ran out of money and needed a job instead of joining himself to a citizen of that land. He could have said, this is dumb. I can work for my father back at home and get uh, civil rights and uh, union and a whole bunch of things. And here, this guy, he's a nut. I'm not going to stay here. I could have gone, I could go on back to my father. He could have made the decision. So could you. Any number of places in your downward walk, you could have come to your senses and made the decision. But you still got the old lies from the old liar working in your mind. And so he had you thinking you're a little bit of a God. I can pull out of this. I can work it out. I can bring it all about. If I just stick with it, it'll work. I went over to a, a seminar the other day on how to win friends and influence people and make a million dollars overnight. <laughs> so I've got the course working, and I see I can do it. He's doing all the wrong things, you see. His problem is he needs to get up and go back to his father, but he's stubborn. He's got the old liar working in his mind. And when he finally gets in the hog pen, that father could have helped him, and he could have gotten up and got out of the hog pen the first day when he saw he was eating carob seed slop. But you know what? He had to come to the end of himself, and the scripture says that. And when he came to the end of himself, when he came to himself, he said, I will arise and go to my father. He made the choice. 
Did that father hit him over the head for wasting that money? Nope. Did that father lambast him because he joined a citizen of that foreign land? Nope. Father never dealt with him directly, but that father indirectly was maneuvering and working in his life. And that's exactly what's happening to some of you right now. I'll tell you your problem. Religion today said it's the devil. When I look at the story of the prodigal as a believer going into the hog pen, I cannot see the devil anywhere in that story. Though the father may have used the devil as a citizen of the far land, and maybe the devil was in the hogs, I don't know. <laughs> but it wasn't the devil anywhere. It was a son in rebellion that would not control his thinking because he could have gotten up and gone back to the Father any time he made his mind up to. Well, that brings me to my final thought. Aren't you glad for that? <laughs> <coughs> understanding. Knowledge and understanding. The only way you can make union work in your life is by getting a new knowledge and a new understanding about you first and then about God. How does new understanding come when you sense your old understanding doesn't work anymore? Now, this is a little hard on you. This is why some people won't come around me. But you've got to admit at some place your old understanding doesn't work anymore. It wasn't wrong when you were in it. It just doesn't work anymore. First thing I tell people when we are going through an institute, I tell them that there's nothing wrong with your past. There's nothing wrong with what you've done, and we won't allow you to degrade it here in this meeting. I don't want anybody to get up and say, well, I wasted years over here at old brother so-and-so's church, and he didn't. I don't want you to talk like that because you needed that. The only things that have brought you to where you are right now in the Lord are all the things that you've participated in up to now. It's like a step on a ladder. You can't do away without a step. If you're going to reach the top, you can't knock out three or four steps and climb the ladder. You've got to have every step. So everything that's happened to you was necessary to get you where you are now. You say, well, I wasted money. That was necessary. You're dumb. <laughs> you say, I became an alcoholic. I didn't need that. That was necessary to get your mind straightened out. See, you don't like that, do you? But it's necessary. I've been through a couple of hells in my life, and I'd like to stomp on the devil every time I think about it. But the Spirit says, don't be dumb again. That was necessary to get you where you are. It's necessary. I've been mixed up in religion I don't like, but it was necessary to get me where I am now. I've been with people I didn't like. That was necessary to get me where I am now. Why? Spiritual growth is nothing but understanding God's workings and dealings in your life. That's what your growth is. I've lost a lot of money, too. I've lost a lot of things in life, temporal, material, carnal things. I'd like to hold on to a lot of them. But I don't degrade whatever happened to me because I wouldn't come to know Jesus as I know him now, as my life, if they hadn't happened. What has happened in all of it is that I love the Christ that is in me so much I wouldn't want to go back to anything that has brought me this far. And when I'm tempted to go back and to do something out of my past that just, I'm just mad at God, mad at you, mad at myself, mad at my wife, mad at my cat, and I'm tempted to go back. You know what restrains me? I'm constrained 
by the love of God that he didn't hold anything against me I had ever done. Why am I holding something against him now that I've done? You want to make union work? Turn over a new leaf every day. I was listening to a preacher the other day that said, unless you get forgiveness the way I'm, that's the way it came across. Unless you get forgiveness the way he preached it, you couldn't have forgiveness. And I thought, how many people are going to be between Jesus and that preacher? thinking I've got to do it this special way. I've got to do it the way this man says. When Jesus says, I'll forgive you 490 times. Now that's more than I can take care of in a lifetime. I mean, I've got near that number, but not quite. Anybody else comes between you and Christ in your forgiveness and in your forgetfulness? Digging it up every time you turn around. You'll never come to union. That's like not having the union joint tight on the pipe. It's going to leak. And sometimes when you start leaking a little bit, your life isn't working out properly. Christianity is not what it ought to be. You think, well, maybe I didn't really get it. Maybe it's not really real. Maybe I don't really know Jesus. Maybe I'm not even saved. And somebody will come on the radio and say, folks, if your life isn't working out, Send me a hundred bucks today and I'll promise you things will change. <laughs> and so you start doing something. You join the do-gooder wagon. You get on the wagon. You say, well, I'll do this and I'll do that and God will bless me. But that's not going to change your mind. Remember, not every good and perfect gift you get from God is good for you. The prodigal son tells us that. He'll give you things that are not good for you because that's the only way he can ever get your attention. I'm going to quit. What is your crucifixion? Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. What is your crucifixion? Your crucifixion is giving up to Christ right here for this union. 